bulletin and uh, there are some announcements there. Okay, is this better? Thank you. Um, turn to the back of your bulletins. Uh, there's a session meeting at 7 on Wednesday. Um, we're still working on the manse on Wednesdays. Um, contact Aaron Whiff or Ruth Fodness. Um, I think we're looking at probably a $9,000 shortfall in completion of the manse and the office space. So um, take that in your considerations. Um, please stand and greet one another. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Holy God, your words feed your people with life that is eternal. Direct our choice and preserve us in your truth that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Please remain standing for the hymn, Sweet, Sweet Spirit, on page 134.
You may be seated. Our responsive reading today is Psalm 19 on page 858 of your uh, pew hymnal or pew Bible. Um, please read the even verses. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. By then is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me, then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. Please join in the glory of pottery. Scripture reading comes from 1 Kings on page 559 of your Bible, 1 Kings 19, 1 through 8. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, but it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Bathsheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around. And there by his head was a cake of bread 
baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into the cave and spent the night. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Spirit of God, we confess that we put on airs more often than we put on the armor of God. We are guilty of girding ourselves with the lies instead of the truth. We try to protect ourselves with arrogance, superstition, self-reliance, instead of righteousness, faith, and your gift of salvation. Our footsteps do not follow your path of peace. And we are quick to use your words to attack one another instead of striking out against the sins we personally commit. Forgive us, holy God. Gift us with the wisdom and strength to change our ways so that we may live as your faithful ambassadors of good news. Amen. Please bow your head in personal reflection. Even though you doubt and question God's love is poured on you, in you, and through you to others, rest assured in God's presence and love for you that will never fail or abandon you. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are healed, restored, and forgiven. Amen. Are there any joys or concerns? in the church this morning. Grateful for the recent rain that we received. Yes. We really appreciate that. Anything else? Any other joys? Karen and Kathleen, all right. Everybody's 39? Yes. Okay. Any other joys? Any concerns in the church? Pray for a successful start of the new school year. All right. Anything else? Yes. Continue prayers for our good Lord is stirring the heart of someone to be our pastor. Okay. Anything else?
Okay. Rich, yes. Prayers for Laura. I think we need to pray for the people of Afghanistan. I heard Frank and Graham this morning say that we should declare a world day of prayer today. Okay. Anything else? Uh, let us bow our heads. Lord, we like directions. We want an owner's manual, a guidebook, a how to guide for our faith, rules and regulations, Time constraints seem to dominate our lives, and we forget the most basic understanding for our faith that is your, our relationship to God through you. God has drawn us here this day to be healed, to listen, to be encouraged in our service to God's word. Today, we lift up in prayer O oh Lord, pray for Laura and guide her through her illness. We also pray for Lord that you uh, stir the spirit of our next new pastor. Uh, start a burning in his soul for him to come to us. Lord, we also pray for all the people in Afghanistan to help them to find peace, to find a way through their troubles here. Lord, we pray for our uh, military and our first responders. Please, please give them strength and courage as we go through our trying times here. Lord, we ask for a successful start of the new school year, for guiding the teachers, the administration, and helping the children go through the next school year. We also lift up those who struggle with a host of issues and situations, which over we feel powerless. Remind us again that your power is sufficient for their needs. They are all in your loving care. Help us to place our trust and confidence in you. Let us feast on the bread of life, who has given to us the best example of what is meant to truly serve you and witness to your love. Encourage us to serve you more fully, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today's scripture comes from John 6, 51 through 59. It's on page 1658 in your hymnal, in your Bible. John 6, 51 through 59. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give up, up his flesh to eat? 
Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is the real food, and my blood is the real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I am in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and dried and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And so ends our scripture writing. We'd now like to welcome Joe Vitek. Thank you. Before we, uh, before we get going, I want to tell you that maybe two weeks ago, um, I had my goddaughter for a visit, and I thought to myself, she's five, and I thought, you know, if I were five, and I was hanging out with a 63-year-old for three days, that'd be really boring, right? So I invited, you know, some of the neighborhood kids that were about the same age, four of five of them, and so for three days, um, they kind of taught me what life was like being five and seven and so forth. So we did horseback riding at Joy Ranch and had a movie night and pizza ranch and so forth and so on at the zoo. So I probably overdid it just a little bit. And so then on Thursday and Friday, I had absolutely no voice of last week. And so then I started researching laryngitis and it says about seven days. So Rich emails me just to make sure I'm going to show up today, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you that I have a voice. And so my voice did come back, but uh, if I sound a little raspy, that's, that's what's going on. So I just thought I'd give you that clarification. So you're like, that poor girl. I got a bottle of water in case maybe the people at Bemis will catch the worst end because I have already been here, right? So um, when, when I read the scripture for today, um, and I prayed about it, and I said, Lord, you know, what is it that you want me to say? What is it that, um, what message do you want me to provide? And this is what the Lord laid on my heart. Um, July the 13th of 2019, it was, a, it was a Saturday. Now, all of you know that I'm a cathomethobacterian, right? So I married a guy that was Catholic, but prior to that I was a Methodist. My daddy was a Baptist, a deacon in the church, so hence I'm a cathomethobacterian. So I'm kind of ecumenical, you might say. But that Saturday, July the 13th, um, it had been less than two months since my husband had died. And we were married for 25 years. And uh, when it came time for me to um, join the other ministers, communion ministers, um, I got up and I went behind the altar, standing behind the priest, and I received the body of Christ. And then I received the blood of Christ, and that's kind of our tradition. And I don't know if you have people that assist your minister when they're given communion or not, but we do. It's a pretty big church. And um, as soon as I drank from the cup and received the blood of Christ, I went somewhere. Now, in reality, I didn't go anywhere. But I went somewhere. And all I could see was this white, bright light. And I heard internally this voice that asked me, do you love me more than Tony? And I said, yes, Lord. And then the voice said to me, then serve me. Then serve me. Do you love me more than Tony? Yes, Lord. Then serve me. 
The next thing I know, um, Father Paul Rutten was standing in front of me, and he was saying, Joe, Joe, Joe. And he's right in front of me. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, why don't you take the choir side? He handed me a plate with um, the body of Christ. And I took the choir side. And I kept asking myself, what was that? What, what was that? Now, I know what I heard and I know what I saw, but I was still kind of dumbfounded. I was like, what was that? You know? And then I thought, well, all these people are here watching me, right? And I later uh, that evening, you know, I, I immediately went home and journaled. How many of you guys journal? Anybody? I journaled the experience, and I talked with my priest, and then a couple of days later, I talked with a couple of spiritual advisors. And then eventually, I asked my priest who was there that night, I said, what, what did you see? He said, well, you know, I knew something was going on because you didn't come to me to, to you know, which is normally what you would do. He said, but I didn't really know what was going on. And I said, okay. I think I've shared that from pulpits maybe twice. But, and then I thought, you know, I know that, you know, I've had a bunch of psychologicals as a police officer, right? And yet I had that experience. And then I thought, okay, you know, there's this thing called the mountain of transfiguration, right, that we all know. We know about Paul on the road to Damascus, right? Now we read this stuff and we... But is God real to us? Is God just some historical God that we read about in the Bible, but is he real, real to us? We just got through singing Sweet, Sweet Spirit. And as I looked at the, and I invite you to open your, open your hymnals back open to that. Sweet, Sweet Spirit. And somewhere in the course, you know, there's a, a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. You know, you can see it on the people's faces. And you know, you know that it's the presence of the Lord. This morning, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to what we, th what we know with our heads and what we believe, maybe oftentimes, with our heart. You know, there's only 17 inches between your head and your heart, Right? And so it's not that far, but oftentimes, you know, we read something, especially in the Bible, and we know it, but do we let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts? Do we have this, like, reality that Jesus is extremely present in, in this place? And it's not just something, he's not a God, or Jesus is not a son. The Holy Spirit is not just something that's out there far off. Or something that we actually possess and put in our pockets, right? But he's very real and he's very present. Our scripture for today, and three times in this passage, Jesus identifies himself as the bread of life. And he identifies himself with bread. He's uh, the bread of life who brings life to all who receive him. Now first Jesus tells us that I am the bread of life come down from heaven. He comes to us from the Father. And he comes to us um, in the form of bread that comes down from heaven. And we can find this theme throughout the fourth gospel of John. And Jesus existing eternally, and he comes to us from the Father, and um, so that he gathers us. So that when he returns to the Father, he brings us with him. Think about that for a minute. God didn't have to take on flesh and blood, but because we're broken and we continue to be broken, Jesus came to reconcile our relationship. Oftentimes, Jesus is referred to as the second Adam, right? And so God, we, we know this, we've read this, that God calls us, he chooses us. We don't choose God. God chooses us, very scriptural. And that he directs us, he knows everything about us, um, he 
knew these things about us before we were born. If we read the prophet Jeremiah, the, the Lord knew us before we were born. He created you. He created all of us for a specific reason. Generically, he created us so that we could be transformed into the body of Christ. The hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus Christ in this broken world. But he also created each and every one of us for a very unique and a very specific purpose. And it's only when we have a relationship with God and we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, which is who gives us our identity, it's then that God reveals to us what our purpose in life is. The world has got it all wrong. They will ask you first and foremost, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you, you know, jump on a, a pony sometimes, and we do this right off into the sunset. I know I have. Not really knowing what I'm supposed to be. And what I should have done from the get-go is I should have worked on that relationship with the Lord. The good news is, is that he never gives up on us, and he continues. And you guys have seen that. Um, they've got a beautiful stained glass window years are too, of Jesus knocking on the door at First United Methodist in Watertown. Because he doesn't give up on us, but he woos us. And, of course, we have free will where we can make a decision to either invite him in or walk away from it, right? But God calls us. Um, God sent his son, Jesus, to draw uh, them to him so that we could be reconciled into the Lord. Now, Jesus, Jesus' words reveal the Father, and through, it's through Jesus, the Son, that the Father is made known to us. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, except the Son. Um, the Son is sent from the Father. Listen to this. The Son is sent from the Father to draw people to himself so that he can reveal the Father and have life. The second time Jesus identifies uh, himself with bread is when he says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert. He's talking about with Moses. But they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. And the link of the, the bread of life with manna in the desert is um, remembered as food given to the Israelites while they were traveling through the desert with Moses. So God has always provided for us in various fashions. Once again, this notion of this theme of salvation is present. Now, I had a subsequent, I'll call it an epiphany, um, light bulb go off, several months after that altar experience. And I was talking to a fellow by the name of Monsignor James Shea, who's from Bismarck, Dakota, Bis Bismarck, North Dakota, and he oversees um, a university there. And he knew, you know, like many of you that have lost a loved one, that I was struggling. I was struggling. And he said to me, Joe, I said, yes, sir. He says, I, I believe that Jesus is in the Eucharist. Now, Catholics call communion the Eucharist. The original meaning of the word Eucharist is, comes from the Greek, and what it means is thanksgiving, gratitude. Later in time, it became known as the Lord's Supper. You guys and other Protestants call it communion, okay? It's, it's, there's some differences in theology, but for the most part, we're remembering the Lord. We're experiencing the Lord. There's a sweet, sweet presence in the place, in this place, and I know it's the presence of the Lord. But I had this uh, talk with uh, Monsignor Shea, and he says to me, Joe, he says, I, I believe that Jesus is in the Eucharist communion. I said, I, I do too. And he said, Joe, he says, I believe that your husband, Tony, is with Jesus. I said, I do too. He said, so Joe, every time you experience Jesus in the Eucharist communion, he says, you get to experience Tony, because he's with Jesus. For those of you that have lost someone near and dear to you, I want you to, next week, you get to receive communion. You're going to have communion. 
And so this week, I, I pray that you think about that loved one, you know? And you think about the fact that they're with Jesus. And that you get the opportunity to not only experience Jesus, but to experience that loved one because they're with Jesus. Now, why do I say this? Because we believe in what we call the communion of saints. How many of you know that term, the communion of saints? Okay. So now, not all the time, but most of the time, you know, we say oftentimes the Apostles' Creed. I was talking to Rich about it this morning. And so I'd like to read that to you um, so that you, you hear what I'm, what I'm about to, to tell you, maybe a little closer. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, little c, meaning universal, the body of Christ. The communion of saints, there it is, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Churches, typically universal Christian churches, we say the Apostles' Creed. Now, the communion of saints has become uh, another term for believers in Christ because we're all part of the body of Christ. Whatever our particular um, you know, denomination may be, we're all part of the same, and, and we recognize, and St. Paul talks about this. He talks about the, the communion of uh, saints in, uh, as all believers in Christ, and you can, you can look that up in Romans 12, verses 4 through 13, or 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27, or in Ephesians 2, verse 19, that all of us, you know, and there's language in there about whether you're, you know, if you got it, everything's essential. And think about your own bodies, right? If, if the ear can't say to the foot, I have no need of you. You know, the pinky toe on your toe, on your foot can't say, I don't need you because you're, you're little, you're small. Because the truth of the matter is we, we wouldn't have good balance if we didn't have a pinky, okay? A pinky toe, right? And the hand can't say, you know, like the eye can't say to the ear, the, eye, the hand can't say to the foot, the eye can't say to the ear, I don't need you, because we're all part of the body of Christ. And my dear friends, you know, we are in this country, you know, we're praying for this country, we're praying for Afghanistan. Uh, we're all in a post-Christian era. Do you guys realize that? Do you realize that we're in a post-Christian era in this country? When I moved from Florida up here to South Dakota in law enforcement, I found that we had limited resources, that for the most part, the agencies were small. And somebody asked me, so what do you love the most about law enforcement in South Dakota? I said, well, there's a lot of things, but one of the things I love about South Dakota law enforcement is that we don't have time to fight. We have limited resources. I just heard Rich say that you need $9,000 more to finish the project. We have limited resources, and as the body of Christ, we really don't have time to fight. We need each other. So we need to recognize that fact, that we're all part of the body of Christ, and that Jesus himself, the head of the church, he is the head of that body. Now... We all belong to the mystical body of Christ as the head, and, and each of us contributes to the good of all and shares in the welfare of all. You know, we know scripturally that any of the gifts that we've been given, and everything is a gift, right? We don't really own anything that the Lord's entrusted 
all of these things to us. But that any gift that has been given to us, it's not for ourselves. Who's it for? It's for each other. It's for each other. The Lord has entrusted any and all of those gifts to us, not for our own good, but for the good of others. The good of others. So that we can become the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus because Jesus was here. He's going back to the Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit living in and through us, with us, so that we can become that voice, those hands, that feet, those feet. The third thing that Jesus says in our passage for today is that I'm the living bread come down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh for the life of the world. Rich just got through reading that just a couple of minutes ago. The third time Jesus associates himself with the bread ties the first two usages together and talks about his self-offering. That Jesus comes from the Father, that he's the bread that gives life, and that we are the recipients of that. And the more that we experience the presence of Christ, the more we look like Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to remind you this morning that you may very well be the only Jesus that someone knows. Let me say that one more time. You may very well be the only Jesus that someone knows because he lives inside of you. He lives among you, with you, in you. That spirit, the Holy Spirit, it's not just something on the text that we read or the passages that we read, something that's historical, but God is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. I know, you know, I know from the altar experience. I know from what Monsignor Shea to me. I know that Jesus Christ is very much alive and that he wants us to be a light to the world. He wants us to be a light in Castlewood. Both readings for today, um, to include the first reading that Rich read from uh, the book of 1 Kings, it is significant um, of Jesus as the bread of life. In our first reading, you'll recall in Kings that Elijah is journeying into the desert and he's fatigued. He, in other words, he's tired and he's worn out. Uh, And he says to the Lord, this is enough, O Lord. Take my life. Enough is enough, God. Take my life. So he comes, um, you know, and he gets under this broom tree. And an angel comes to him and he tells him, he says, it's time for you to get up and eat and drink. Then he lays down again, and the angel comes back a second time with a a command. He says, get up and eat, else the journey will be too long for you. So Elijah gets up and eats. Now, I see a lot of probably parents and grandparents in here. How many times you got to wake up your kid or spouses? How many times you got to wake up your spouse? You say, get up. It's time to get a moving on, right? Well, the angel tells Elijah, it's time to get up. And oh, by the way, Elijah, if you don't eat and drink something, you're not going to have enough energy to make it where you're supposed to be going. Now, he was going to go to have this encounter, right? Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, one and the same. So Elijah gets up and he eats and he goes out strengthened by that food. Next Sunday, you're going to have communion. And my prayer, my hope is that you are strengthened by that food that you receive. I want you to think about this, that we have this journey, this pilgrimage in life. Now, you know this. This is a temporary, this is a temporary thing. And you've heard me say this before. To be human, right, the the death rate among humanity is hovering around 100%. You've heard me say that before. Because this is temporary. 